So it's no secret that I've spent a lot of or the better half of the last three or four years learning about neuroscience and how people learn in the first place. And I thought I'd make a quick video about that because in this meta basics series, I just want you to be a better information retriever and a better learner itself. Because if I teach you things like design or code and you're not retaining it, you're not keeping it inside your head, we're wasting time, right? So this video is about how to learn. So let's get right to it. Awesome. So this episode is called How to Learn. And, you know, as usual, I put a quick comic strip about it. This one is by the awkward Yeti. Um, <laughs> the heart says, that's it. I'm done. I can't do it. And then the brain says, you can't give up learning so easily. It's, it's a hard process for most people. And the heart just walks away. It says, you figure it out. I'm just going to go watch some game shows. And the brain says, no, I need your help to stay motivated. And then the heart says, fine, learn something that genuinely interests me and I will help. And then the brain counters with saying nothing is a genuine interest. You need to build your own interests. And, you know, obviously the heart is not involved in learning at all. It's just the brain actually having a conversation with itself. And then when we come to the performance section of, me of the meta series, you will learn how you don't have one brain, but you have put it two brains who are constantly arguing with each other. Um, but more on that later. For now, let me remind you that learning is a hard process for everybody. And you are most likely to learn the things that you are interested in. Now, I made an episode about this a long time ago called How I Learn Things. And one thing I've noticed is that every child out there, right, especially in the country. So in poorer places like South America, a lot of children want to be footballers. And the main reason they want to be footballers is because they look at a footballer on TV. They look at them as role models. They see them running around. They, they imagine themselves in the shoes of a footballer one day, tackling five or six players, walking through, bolting and scoring a goal, and then getting the adulation of not just their teammates, but also all the fans in the crowd, right? For us to be interested or passionate about something, we need to imagine ourselves being successful at doing it. It needs to be something that's interesting, that gets us the social adulation and the reward, which is why I really believe that every field needs to have their role models. Now, coming back to the idea of learning something that's boring, right? Say, I know everybody wants to learn, say, digital marketing or, or football or advertising because it's, it seems like it's fun, right? But more dry topics like coding or, or if you look at mathematics, nobody wants to learn it. And I firmly believe that that's just because you don't have the interest in it. There are no role models to look at. We, we don't have anybody to look up to and say, I want to be like that person. Because believe it or not, humans work via social mimicry, right? We have mirror neurons in our brain that want us to, to feel like other people. To, we, we actually want to be in their shoes. And that is why we learn, right? So in this episode, I'm going to teach you why interest is an important part of learning and how we can cultivate a better way to learn, why that happens. Right, so it works, learning works like the act of arranging a puzzle. It's not linear, right? You need multiple different pieces. Um, and it's like this, right? You have, if I give you one piece of a puzzle and you're looking at that piece and you're kind of working with it, there's not much you can do with it, right? And if I give you two pieces of a puzzle, you might not be able to connect it because they're not related. But if I give you three or four pieces, and even if you manage to make one or two connections, then you can slowly start imagining the bigger picture, right? So what ends up happening is you might learn one concept which is one piece of the puzzle. And then you might learn four different pieces of the concept, right? So it might be something there, something there, something there, which are not related, which don't connect with each other. And that might confuse you. But at some point, one or two of the pieces are, are going to connect, right? It's just suddenly going to connect. And suddenly the entire piece is going to start making sense to you. And as you piece more and more things together, you get a better or bigger idea of the, of the bigger picture, right? So you're able to see things from a zoomed out perspective. So my biggest problem with the way textbooks are structured today is that you learn one concept at a time and you're tested on one concept at a time. And I firmly believe that humans do not learn that way. Humans first learn by being shown the bigger picture. If I first show you the bigger picture and then I break it down into separate chunks, it's easier for you to put it back together. So for you to arrange a puzzle in the first place, you need to see first what the complete picture looks like, right? Without making you do any activity or learning anything. You just need to see the bigger picture first. And then I need to break it down into small chunks and show you how it fits, right? So that is the ideal way to learn things. 
Now we're going to learn how to learn effectively. We're going to learn first how to see the bigger picture. Then we're going to break the bigger picture down into manageable chunks. Then we're going to learn how to teach other people what we've learned because that's an important part of retention. And I'll tell you why in a bit. So everything in the world today is a science. We tend to categorize things as science or commerce or whatever. And I think that's the wrong way to look at things, right? Everything is a science. We kind of, we have uh, a worldview, like an entire world where everything is related. Everything is cause and effect, right? And slowly over time, we are able to put uh, things like a puzzle into their different pieces, right? We might have something like physics and we might have something like mathematics and we might have something like commerce. And until now, we've always believed, hey, this is not a science. This is completely different. This is completely different. But slowly, we're able to see how they all fit together, right? So the first thing to do is to become a questioner. No textbook or paper has the right answers. Science is a, it's a continuously evolving field, right? We know a lot more today than we knew 10 years ago. If you don't ask questions, you will probably not discover what you do and do not know, and you will never challenge existing literature. In the fields of science or commerce or even something like um, religion, we've always been encouraged to kind of look at what we know today, look at what we knew 10 years in the past and see if anything has changed, right? And we tend to question and challenge things. And I think that is, I think the most important thing to have, like it's the spirit of curiosity. Why does that happen? Is that true? Are you sure? So then you look for interconnections. Content in every field is always a network of interconnected ideas, not a random list of bullet points that you have to memorize. That's not how the world is. You can't, you know, build a boat by saying, hey, here are the five things that I memorized. Here are the things I'm going to say again. You build a boat by taking a hammer and screwing in the nails across planks of wood. You don't have to memorize like a parrot. It's useless. Google can do a better job than you, like I mentioned in the last episode, which means that you will become useless in the workforce if you just memorize bullet points. It's not going to work anymore. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Relate content whenever possible to issues, problems and practical situations in your life. If you can't connect something to your everyday life, you do not know it. This ability to see the bigger picture often happens first in your daily life. So why do we need emotions to learn? Why, why does interest even matter when it comes to learning? It's actually because of the way our brain has been structured. You see, we've got the older parts of the brain, which, are the, which is the amygdala, which is responsible for emotions. We've got the hippocampus, which is the seat of memory. And then we've got the prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of behavior. The parts of your brain that are responsible for memories, right? Memories and emotions are very connected. When one is triggered, the other opens too. And I think the, a good way to kind of a good analogy for this is to look at them as co-joint drawers, right? When you open the seat for memory or when you open the seat for emotions, the seat for memory comes out too. It's like they're co-joint there. You can't pull out one without pulling out the other. This is why when you have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you have intense flashbacks, right? Because you had a very emotional moment and which is why your memory is so tight in the moment that you can remember it very clearly. Think about the things you remember from your past, from your childhood or, or even when you were a younger adult, right? You probably remember the things um, that had intense emotions associated with them. Could be your birthday. It could be somebody beating you up. It could be a very, you know, funny movie that you watch or a very funny scene, a movie, but you tend to recollect and remember the things that you, that had emotions tied into them, right? So when you try to learn, try to get emotionally charged up or learn from a source that makes you laugh, cry or become emotional or show you things experimentally, right? So why does this happen? This happens because of the same idea behind what happens when a deer is faced with headlights. So say you have a deer and the deer is walking past a road, right? And a car is in its way. The car flashes the headlights and the deer looks at the car, right? Now, what happens to the deer? Right? The deer gets very, very scared, right? It's, it's an existential threat. It might die and it bolts. It just runs, right? So the emotion it feels is very high. It's an emotion of fear and it has to run. Now, why emotion is connected to memory is because when this deer has run away, unlike human beings, the deer doesn't say, oh, I shouldn't have gone there. Um, you know, what was I doing there? What is the car doing? It doesn't think long term. The deer thinks very short term and the deer says, I'm safe now. I'm going to go back to grazing. 
But one thing that's happened in the back of the deer's head, because such an emotional moment has just passed, is that the deer remembers where it's been. And it says, whatever happens, do not go there. Right? We will remember that a car is bad for us. We will remember the location where this happened. And that is it. Let's go back to grazing now. It's the same thing with human beings. We evolved these abilities to retain memories mainly because we should mainly to avoid places where there were predators. So if you saw a tiger in the morning and you got really scared and you ran away, you wouldn't go back there because you would remember the exact location where you saw the tiger, exactly what the tiger looked like because you do, you fear for your life. So I know it sounds weird, but one of the main reasons we kind of uh, retain memories is because of survival. And, you know, in later episodes, when we start talking about management, we'll show you how survival and reproduction actually programmed us for almost everything we do today, right? So because of that kind of quirk, um, we have memories. And because of this same reason, a deer remembers where it almost got killed and it doesn't remember much else. Similarly, you remember a lot of other things, but the main things you remember are when you get the most emotionally charged. So... We're talking about the bigger picture and, you know, in my book, Pajama Profit, I kind of broke this down, but I'll do it again. Um, you take a real world example of something. You take an application or a real world example. So, for example, if you want to learn football, one of the best things to do is either go out and play the game a little bit or watch a TV show like an emotional, emotionally charged um, kind of tournament, right? Because, you know, that nail biting kind of finish that you see between two teams when it's on the 90th minute. Well, you need that to see a real world example, right? So you see a real world example of it and then you break it down to individual chunks, right? So it then you could actually break it down to, okay, there are the players, there's the ball, there's the audience, there's the field, there's, and then there's player psychology, there's positioning, you know, those are the individual chunks, right? And then you teach it or discuss it with others. So once you've broken down into these, uh, something into these chunks, you kind of, you know, either practice it or go to another person and kind of tell him, okay, this is what this is, this is what this is. Just to, because when you tell another person, you have to make logical sense to yourself first. So the idea with you teaching something to somebody else is that you learn it properly yourself first. So one of the things that we do on this course, and if you see the entire course in the platform, it's exactly about this. First, we show you the bigger picture. Then we break it down into chunks. And then we say, look, we've got the chunks, um, learn it properly. You practice it a little bit, and then you teach it to other people to memorize it. That's why we have the entire discussion platform. We have the mentorships because you need for you to retain, you need to share, right? Always connect all topics to real world use cases, or you will get bored and the memory center of your brain will shut off, which is the reason why if I teach you the Pythagoras theorem or, or some Boltzmann constant, you're not going to care about it because you're like, when am I going to use this in the real world? Whereas something that's a lot more useful, right? Which, which you, could use on a daily basis. For example, if I taught you exactly how to register a company, or if I taught you exactly how to run digital marketing ads, you are more likely to retain it because you know you will be using it in the near future. So you might ask where creativity fits into this. Why don't if you're just taking the bigger picture, breaking it down into chunks, we learn the chunks and you know, then we see the bigger picture. Where is creativity? When will anything new ever be created? And the idea is that when you learn to chunk something, and you understand its individual parts, you understand the relationship between their individual parts, um, then you can actually reconnect the parts in a new way. Piano players actually understand this very well, right? So what they do, and this is how a piano player learns, is that first they will learn the individual keys. They'll say, okay, this is the e, A key, this is the E key, this is the B key, this is the C key. Then they will learn simple songs like say Twinkle Twinkle, where they say, okay, A, B, C, whatever. I don't know the exact progression, but that's, that's how they learn. They memorize maybe five or 10 songs. That is the bigger picture. Then they will learn more and more complex pieces. And as they learn more and more complex pieces, they will understand the relationships between the parts. It's not just that they will learn how the A key sounds or how the B key sounds. They will learn what the progression of A to B sounds like. And eventually they will start saying, hey, a lot of people do an A to B. That sounds good. But a B to A doesn't sound so good. So they start learning the relationships between different parts and what progression starts sounding good. For example, when you're playing football, you might learn that passing to one teammate and then being passed back and then scoring a one, two is a good and smart way to actually play because it confuses the other players. But that is a relationship between different players and the ball. 
right? It's not just me and or or it's just not just about the ball or the audience or the player himself. It's about the relationships between different parts. So once you learn the relationship between different parts, that is when you can truly start being creative. So once you're able to play complex pieces, you uh, are able to understand the relationship between parts, then you can arrange the parts in different ways. So if you're doing an A to B followed by a B to C, you can do an A to B and then you experiment with a C to D, right? And you say, wow, that's a that's something new that I, I haven't heard before. And a lot of this is accidental, right? Whether I do design or code or whatever, a lot of it is accidental, right? And Nothing in the world is truly original. There are no true or original ideas. They're often built on top of each other, as we will see later in the course. This is why you shouldn't believe that your ideas matter too much. Execution does. Can you bring that idea to life? Right. So here are two graphs of learning. This is, you know, I've seen this happen with almost everybody. I've helped a lot of people learn a lot of different things. It begins with, I know nothing. I'm useless. I'm incompetent. And then after a few weeks, it goes into, I know everything. I understand this entire place or this entire field perfectly. And then as you start learning the relationships between different things, it goes down to, I know very little, but I know more than zero, right? So it's not that like a piano player who's taught the A key, B key, C key, after a while, they start saying, oh, I know all the keys well. But the complexity is not in knowing those keys. The complexity is knowing the relationships between those keys and how much you can do with the relationship between those two keys, right? Because it's a combination, it's a permutation and combination thing. And then over time, as they learn that there are near infinite combinations, they go back down to knowing that they know very little, right? The next graph is an idea of the frustration that happens when you learn something new. When you begin a journey, there's a lot of reward, right? You're just learning something new. You're learning new techniques. It's, it's awesome. It feels good. But after a while, it could be one week. It could be one day for some people. It could be a few months. The reward versus effort is reduced. This is known as the dip. For example, when, when you try learning a new language, in the beginning, because you're learning new words, you're able to say, hello, thank you, whatever. You feel really good. You're like, I've learned something. But after a while, that reward versus effort, uh, that reward versus effort dips, right? Because you're like, I know the basics, but I don't want to sit and learn what you call a water bottle in this language or what you call a phone in this language, because those are not, those are diminishing returns. Those are small things. But if you push through, you will eventually break the barrier and go into a place where you're able to hand, where you know enough to be comfortable, but yet know that you know very little in the grand scheme of things, right? So all I'm asking you to do with this course, especially when learning gets hard, especially after the first few weeks, because I know you guys will stick for the first few weeks. I have the stats on YouTube, right? But after a while, when it starts getting hard, stick through it and you will push through that barrier. So that's it for this episode. So I hope this video has set the tone for you to be able to learn a little better. And hopefully in the future, um, you're able to retain a lot more of the information that you've been, that's been thrown at you, especially in an ever connected, ever noisy world.